Welcome back um, to our second part of the program, which we created as an accompanying dialogue with artists, scholars, and organizers from Concordia, UCAM, and the Montreal dance community in the form of a roundtable discussion titled Technologies of Transmission. Among other issues, we hope to speak to the importance of archivization, legacy production, preservation of dance pedagogy, and black knowledge in dance. I also want to invite you to not maybe stay there the entire time, but also go back and forth, walk around, look at the videos in the back of us and come back to our conversation so this, that this becomes a little bit a movable space as well. So um, just to open this up. Hello. <laughs> so I'm going to um, introduce um, he called. Um, so I'll read your biography. Uh, so uh, Guy Coles is a Belgian dance dramaturg who worked with, among others, with Sidi Larby Shekawi, Daniel Denoyer, Christoph, Christopher House, and Akram Khan. For, for 12 years, Coles curated the dance program of Art Center Verut in Ghent, Belgium. Uh, his most recent publications include In Between Dance Cultures on the Migratory Artistic Identity of Sidi Larbi Sherkawi and Akram Khan, um, Imaginative Bodies, Dialogues in Performance Practices, uh, the choreography, the core, and the choreo politics of Alain Platel's Le Balisset Labé, and Performing Morning Laments in Contemporary Art, which just came out in 2021. Kultz is professor of dance at the UCOM. Thank you for joining us. Um, I also introduce Jens. <laughs> uh, Jens Richard uh, Giersdorf is professor and chair of the Department of Contemporary Dance at Concordia. He is the author of uh, The Body of the People, East German Dance Since 1945, translated into German as Volksheine Korper. He edited choreographies of 21st century wars with Gay Morris, a dance research journal special issue on Randy Martin with Mark Franco, and the third edition of the Rutledge Dance Studies Reader with Yutian Wong. And I'm also going to introduce uh, Sasha Kleinplatz. <laughs> Uh, Sasha Kleinplatz is uh, the co-artistic uh, director of the creation and curatorial collective Wants and Needs Dance. She is currently in the first year of her PhD research at Concordia University, where she is researching choreographic knowledge transfer and emergent collectivity. I would like to introduce Lilia Mestre, who is a performing <laughs> artist, dramaturg, and researcher working mainly in collaborative forms. She joined our department here at Concordia in November 2022. Since 2008, she has been involved in APAS, uh, which is the Advanced Performance and Scenography Studies, a transdisciplinary pro postgraduate program in Brussels, where she was the artistic coordinator for five years. Mester works with scores, intersubjectivity setups, and other chance-induced processes as emancipatory artistic and pedagogical tools. B.K. Preston is an assistant professor in the Department of History at Concordia University and a member of the University of the Arts internationally situated MFA research faculty in dance. Preston's work appears at intersections of history and performance studies, taking up kinesthetics and sensation in dance research that traverses difficult histories and the work of contemporary artists. Thank you for being here. MJ Thompson is a writer and teacher working on dance performance and visual art. Committed to popular culture and everyday aesthetics, she has written for a wide variety of publications, including Ballet Tanz, Border Crossings, The Brooklyn Rail, Canadian Art, Dance Current, Dance Inc., Dance Magazine, The Drama Review, the Globe and Mail, Women in Performance and Theater Journal. She's Associate Dean Research for Research and Graduate Studies at the Faculty of Fine Arts here at Concordia. Thank you. And we are not going to introduce uh, Angelique again, but um, we are very happy uh, to have Angelique also joining us for this part of the conversation. 
I just wanted to say uh, we are going to start to ask some questions of some of our um, uh, participants here. But if you feel um, that you would like to ask a question or respond to anything that we are saying, please do so. We will try to uh, get you a microphone over there and also us responding to each other's conversations so that this can really become a, a discourse. I actually have a, que a question for Guy, maybe to start the, the, the process here. <laughs> so. Um, we were wondering um, with, about your background as a dramaturg, a curator and writer who is investigating the relationship between dance and writing. Um, if you might want to start our conversation, and that's probably something that uh, uh, applies to several of us, to talk about the value of writing and archivization, archivization in dance and dance pedagogy. Yeah, so I'm happy to repeat that letter yeah. part. Yeah, so uh -huh. uh, the value of of, of of writing and archivization in dance and dance pedagogy. Uh, the relationship between writing and and movement dance or or somatic experiences was uh, the main uh, subject of my practice based PhD, um, and I got. The most critical question I got on the defense of this PhD was that um, writing is a very limited form of archiving dance. And meanwhile, <laughs> there's much more interesting ways of archiving dance. And uh, Espace Perot is a good example of it. But also, uh, I mean, again, I think the Motion Bank uh, uh, that um, was developed in Europe around the work of Foresight is another example. Um, and I had to admit that, uh, but at the same time, um, writing has always been my own form of expression. Um, and I've been looking for a long way of, of making the writing more embodied, because I do feel that a lot of um, Polish writers need to be a bit critical, but a lot of academic writing on dance is not embodied enough. Um, and it's when I started developing a physical practice very late, like I was already past 35, um, that I also felt that my writing got, um, uh, yeah, reached out more to, to other people. So I think writing is just one form of archiving. Um, I mean, Maybe what is more important, and this is something I think Angelique mentioned this morning, is I think the language that you develop accompanying uh, a dance a movement practice, whether in teaching, whether um, in a creative process as a choreographer, um, is extremely important. And that language should be a language that supports the agency, the imagination, of the people participating in the practice. Mm -hmm. And I think all great choreographers that I worked with were also masters in, in often developing their own unique way um, of, of using language. I remember one extreme case, which was a German choreographer, Joachim Schlömer, um, that I came across early on in my career. And he would not use one single word. He would use a completely uh, a language of sounds, uh, wow. but his having worked with the same dancers over a longer period, they knew exactly what, through that vocalization, they knew exactly what kind of qualities of movements he was looking for them. Um, so we, we can't do without language. I think language is there to accompany that, but it should also be there to, um, to support um, the physical expression, the imagination. And so writing about dance, um should try to do the same thing that it should kind of not um close interpretations but open up interpretations like that. thank you so much um it reminds me also like of my um early on in in my phd um, um someone who um supervised the first PhD program in the US is called Susan Lee Foster. And she was actually very invested in also 
choreographing writing, which is one of our major mm -hmm. publications also, to start it to really physicalize the writing process and the theorization process. Yeah. And so she was one of the earlier people who actually also gave talks that were danced out and, and choreographed through. And, and we are more familiar with that uh, form now um, through the form of the lecture demonstration that became a lecture performances that became very prevalent in, in Europe at a certain point and, and reached other areas. Areas, uh, through some other systems. But it's actually interesting to think about that, that it doesn't go just one way, but actually that this investigation is something that happened in both on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we get to the second question? <laughs> so the second question is addressed to MJ Thompson. And uh, it goes in the with the idea of the writing. Uh, and uh, because you're uh, writing a book on Louise uh, Cavalier, uh, we were interested to see on how the personal or the, the I'm going to read it, uh, how to capture or historicized individual approaches um, towards pedagogy and teaching. So, the, I mean, in the case of Louise, I, I don't know if this is the, what is the, the, the focus, but more maybe the idea of um, the person Right, we had this this morning as well. It was like on how the person, and the, maybe this is a new move also, like the, the situating the person uh, in the context, in the socio political context. And yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so lots, lots to think about with that question. Thank you for it. It's great to be at this table with, with dance brainiacs. Um, <laughs> I, I want to just maybe start um, by engaging a little bit on the question of how dance and writing can function, because I think that, um, you know, I'm sort of like, hell yes, more writing, more dance, more writing, more scoring, more photographs, more videotapes. Um, I sort of think the more the merrier, and that our job is not to sort of um, necessarily privilege any of these kinds of archival moments. I think they all work in different ways and trigger different kinds of um, thinking alongside them. And so I, I advocate for like more, more, more in terms of documentation, whatever that looks like and alternative modes of documentation, zine writing, oral history, um, you know, as, as much as possible. Um, and then I would say that like my own approach um, is really to kind of emphasize materiality. And by materiality, I mean to think about the situation of the dancer and the performer and the material labor and the material joy and the sort of materiality of the bodies they construct and to really somehow um, try to find that or see that um, as someone who's primarily working as a writer and historian. Um, and historian sounds maybe more formal or um, fixed than it really is. Mm -hmm. It's messy mm -hmm. and really fun and um, often uh, reveals a lot about ourselves as much as about the dancers we're working with and thinking alongside with. Um, so I would say I really try to emphasize that materiality and maybe it's um, it dovetails with what you're saying, Guy, um, to the extent that I think a lot about writing the body. What does that mean? Um, so one way I understand that is to think about my own voice um, and to try and, um, you know, sort of uh, grab hold of some of the more interesting experiments in writing, like, you know, what do the poets say about how to make language live and feel alive? Um, you know, what do... Uh, and for me, that's always a return to the materiality of the word, the language, and, and that ricochet between, you know, the present moment in the archive, that ricochet between uh, the body and the word. Um, and it's a giant experiment. Like, you don't know how it's going to play out. And God knows there are many great failures mm -hmm. in the <laughs> words I've produced over the years. But um, But that's the dream. So I would just say that and then to think about um, um, you know the book that I'm working on about Louise Le Cavalier uh, hashtag fangirl um, <laughs> I super write from a place uh, where I'm trying to kind of think about what is objectivity what what's the story I'm telling um, to acknowledge my position in that story 
um, but to really do justice to a body of work um, and that's, uh, you know, always dancers know stuff, performers know things, and um, I want to pay tribute to that in a sense. Uh, at the same time, I want to avoid the biography. I want to avoid mm -hmm. myth-making. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's the sort of dance that I, I work with in language. Um, let's stop there. Mm -hmm. I would be curious to actually get to both of you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and to think, uh, can, you, can you give some examples of like what creative uh, writing is or embodying I mean like some like how do you put yourself in <laughs> in the doing of that right just just to, to go to practice in, in mm -hmm. to concrete uh, yeah. practice first of all I, I the same thing I think the contemporary even academic writing has to situate the writer so I always also um, in my recent book uh, in which I discuss a huge diversity of practices that I consider contemporary forms of lament but it's completely interwoven with my own history, uh, with, with mourning. I, I mean, I couldn't do it otherwise. Um, for me, it became very, it became, I think through work, I have a similar history as Angelique in the sense that I was trained as a linguist originally. Uh, I had an interest in theater, but when I finished my master, if somebody would have told me that <laughs> Three years later, I would make the rest of, spend the rest of my career in dance. I would have not believed them. And when I started getting into dance, it was out of not understanding, not knowing, curiosity, but very quickly um, realizing there's a lot here for me to, uh, to learn, um, also about my own body and, and its own um, health issues. Um, and also at the same time, it was okay. I, I I've been writing from a as as maybe I was three four years. I don't know. Like when as far as I know, the first when I had the first words I could express, maybe the writing was more drawing. But then I realized through dance that I can't write sitting behind a desk. I have to mm. I have to move. I have to walk uh, around the block, and then ideas come, and then I write them down. Um, and this this became then also a performative practice that I developed with a colleague and friend, um, Canadian choreographer Lynn Snelling, which was originally called Repeating Distance. Now we call it Rewriting Distance. And we, it's an improvised form combining originally movement and language, spoken language. But then in the, the, the latest editions, we also started making the writing performative. Mm -hmm. um, and it is about, yeah, just um it's such a different way of uh the writing is transforms so much and also reaches out much easier i think to to a reader because of that process last thing and, and this is also something um for me writing is always a dialogical practice mm -hmm. so my preferred form of writing is having a conversation mm -hmm. and then uh new ideas emerge in the in between and then these new ideas bring my own thinking to the next stage. Mm -hmm. So before I write something out, I've been practicing it orally over a long uh, mm -hmm. period of time. And like at least one book was just a series, it's just mm -hmm. a series of dialogues because that's, uh, and even if I, if I write a book more formally in one voice, I would still send every chapter or every, when I talk about somebody else, I always try to get in touch with the person, send them the material, and then what they give back or the comments they give mm -hmm. is to integrate is get it integrated in the writing to bring it to the next level of articulation. Um, so, um, you know, there's things I think about, like, you know, I come out of a journalism background and so there's always a scolding editor in uh, the back of my mind saying plain language big ideas you know plain language um, who's your audience who will read this i don't think i always get there and um, i'm also in a milieu where um, there's a pressure to write in a certain kind of way oh, and it's not arbitrary 
it's it, there, it's Absolutely. there for a real reason, um, and um, many of the codes uh, involve years of of thinking and and work. So I want to honor that, but at the same time, um, really try to engage with an audience. Um, so so that's one thing. I also think of um, how scripted we are all the time. Um, you know, Burroughs said that language was a virus, right? So we're, we're always uh, absorbing words and playing with words that we pick up in this viral environment. And um, I think about how we break the script and break our habits of language. Um, you know, with every sentence, there's an ending that's already been written for us. And it's been written by, you know, the myriad things we've seen in newspapers or on TikTok, et cetera. So how do I uh, pay attention to the ways that I'm scripted and, and break that and resist it? And sometimes it's hilarious because I'll know <laughs> what the script is and then um, I'll say, well, what if I just throw this kooky word in there and what does it do? Like it can really be a level of play and then I realized, no, bad idea. <laughs> Walk away from the cliff. But, but sometimes it works. And so to try and have that level of magic mm -hmm. and play, mm -hmm. um, I think is really key. Um, and um, then I would just say that I take a lot of inspiration from the materials that I'm working with. Um, so uh, dance suggests things and it makes you speak in certain ways. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to think about um, what it looks like, what it feels like, and what words might go near that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there are other kinds of materials that we work with. So there's photographs, there's scores, there's drawings, and you know the whole assortment of ephemera that, that we work with as writers. So flyers letters you know i'm working on a piece right now that um involves reading a love letter and it's a super sexy juicy love letter um and it may or may not relate to the dance so how do i navigate that how do i you know distance my own sort of pleasure um and and see well no there is something very real there uh about how collaboration works and how uh, these artists are thinking about um the material they're making. So to, to, to be inspired by those materials, the language that, that they bring to life and suggest, um, that's a kind of ongoing thing as well. I think it's great to think that writing is such a physical practice, no? Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, maybe, I don't know, it's not a question for one person, but maybe VK a little bit, and then also Sasha and Angelique to bring you both in here as well. Um, VK, you work a lot of on, on uh, severely historical material. <laughs> so, and, and I'm really interested in, in the, the, the reawakening of those uh, historical voices into a physicalized practice through your work. And, and, um, to make that still relevant, but also um, apply some of the critic critical lenses that we are utilizing today in our practice, in our discourse on, on practice and with practice um, onto those historical material. And, and related to that, I, I'm really interested in, in um, also the issue of like going beyond the individual and, and so thinking about collective knowledge transfers and, and collective um, ways of, of engaging with a practice and also rethinking and re-emerging that practice and enabling a collective response to that. And that's maybe something that I can put towards you two in a, in a way. So if... Cool. Okay. Um, I loved, um, Lilia left off with this notion of writing as a physical practice, and I completely agree. And, you know, so as somebody who trained for a long time in dance and, and ultimately was negotiating a, a fluctuating injury, so be like, no problem at all. And then oh, this week, super big problem. Um, you know, I use my um, improvisation mind when I'm writing, and I know that it's going to work when I'm in that improvisation mind when I'm writing, and I know it's not going to work when I'm trying to do something different. <laughs> the kind of voice that comes out varies, and, and it depends on what the voice needs to do. Um, 
that said, like, I love that severely historical. I'm just coming out of a very different <laughs> like conversation. <laughs> so my brain is like, oh my God, twister. Um, because these regimes of what constitutes past, present, and future really shift around. Um, because part of the world in which I encounter those documents um, is also my present world, right? Like, so, you know, I get the fun part, the sometimes maybe sneaky part. Like, I get to go to cool places and look at cool stuff and then try to talk about a wider world in which we might maybe start to have ways to think about the congregate, the communal, this, the rapport of audiences, the kinds of genders, the kinds of understandings of race, the kinds of understandings of ability and disability that are going on in those. Um, and I think the kinds of material I pick, it's going on, like it's, it's definitely there. Um, and so at a time when, for example, that wasn't supposed to be there, or we understand the narrative isn't there, I feel pretty sneaky and able in, in, in that moment of being seeking the way in which I can find the evidence to push back. But I feel like I'm pushing back from a body informed by questions of force and counterbalance and thinking it through. Um, what kind of voice sometimes it has to take a certain kind of voice i've submitted things and they're like we like this but it's not in our voice and so i do have to revise it to fit the journal style and sometimes i prefer the more like literary style that i that i like to write in um but i i'm okay with doing that editing process sometimes to get it into another voice if it's going to circulate um but i think i write in a ton of completely different voices so that's actually quite fun like they're like studies yeah i mean first of all i have a tremor and i was going to say like i'm not nervous i just have a tremor but i am nervous and i do have a tremor um <laughs> so i think for me what's interesting about listening to everyone is that like my body is not a safe place to write from right like my body is not a safe place in general. And a lot of that has to do with the training I went through and the trauma I went through. So like, I think we're still sort of operating on a binary between the brain and the body. And a lot of what I'm trying to do is be like, okay, I know my body doesn't feel safe. I know I feel safer in my brain, but I know I work in a body-based practice. So how can I sort of knit these things together in a way that is satisfying to me and legible to the people I'm in community with. Um, so I'm really thinking about that a lot. And then in terms of collect, sorry, <laughs> in I just kicked Jens. Um, <laughs> in terms of collectivity, um, I don't think I'm answering your question, but I'm just gonna talk to what is in my brain, which is that like, as somebody who was teaching at Concordia for two years, what I experienced was a student collective that was a bit in crisis and a lot of the research in my PhD comes out of trying to be gentle towards that crisis <laughs> that people were experiencing. And that crisis was going on for all different reasons. A lot of it had to do with COVID, but a lot of it had to do with other things, um, waves that were moving through the pedagogy and waves, waves that were moving through the morale. Um, so what I'm so aware of is that I feel responsible to this collective I experienced um, and wanting to write about choreography in a way that is legible, that does offer signposts, that does try to answer questions in a way that like students can concretely access. Um, I'm not really, I don't think my writing is gonna end up in journals. I don't think it's gonna end up anywhere. I, I don't think it's gonna end up with me getting a position in a university. But what I do feel like is that like, okay, I was accountable and ethical towards the collective I was experiencing. And that feels right. Like that feels like I'm journeying on a path that I can, 20 years from now, I can be like, I'm good with this, hmm. you know? Yeah, I hear you. Um, hi, Sash, we haven't seen each other yet. This is a hug. <laughs> um, uh, from my point of view, I mean, I only write because somebody says I have to, basically. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure I would, um, because for me, I write with my body. That's what I do. 
that is writing for me. Um, and I'm interested in the ephemerality of that writing. Yeah, so it's not, it's not something that I approach as, oh, drats, it's a pity there's nothing left after that. No, I'm interested precisely in that. And if anything, in the resonances, what I would call, you know, not even a trace, but a resonance that is left beyond that movemented writing. Um, as a result, then, when I think in terms of uh, uh, concrete traces, that are shareable. I mean, a little bit like Guy you were describing, you know, I mean, I've also discovered a lot the role of orality um, in my writing. <laughs> but the, 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 and again, this is, um, I think Irene, you had asked about my background, you know, my, my cultural background. And of course, orality is, grew up with st storytelling as part of traditional, you know, modes of living. Um, so there are, there are lots of stories that I grew up with. And the, the, I also think better here, which, which is entirely embodied. And so I've learned things like, I, I, I like to talk, most of you who know me, has, you all know that. So I just, I record myself talking. And then let that be you know, the place that the writing emerges from. Also because I feel, um, contrary to Sasha, for example, who's talking about the, the lack of safety that you feel in your body, the, the, my body is my safe place. That, that's, that's where I go, you know? Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm more, um, confident, committed, comfortable, engaged, anchored, you know, that kind of stuff in what emerges from my body as language, whether it's moved or spoken and then ultimately written. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. Maybe like something you mentioned, just as a little anecdote to, to go off with the different levels of physicality in that process, which is like there at, at all stages of it. Also, uh, you mentioned that I originally worked on, on uh, dance in East Germany, which is a country that only existed for 40 years. And it was like um, interesting to me. And, and I was also reluctant to write about an entire culture um, uh, there uh, from the perspective of one person who encountered it through dance and dancing. And, and at that point, then eventually also studying um, a dance uh, uh, science or dance studies. But th th there, there was this moment where I returned to an archive and I had to find it. And it it was really complicated because they were like doing reconstruction of the archive while I was there and it was I was researching mass dances that happened in East Germany where thousands of people actually in stadiums um, did like pro-socialist uh, propaganda dances and I was really trying to find the, the documents of this how did they were choreographed how much were they paid for it how was this organized that we got to those like synchronicity and things like that so I was sitting there and and they really resented me coming into that archive. I don't know why, because no one came there. They should have been happy that I was there. But I was, they put me in the hallway. And while there were reconstructions, so every single time um, I was like with, with those copies of those documents and they were like this flimsy uh, thermocopies because that was the only thing that was available in East Germany. And so every single time uh, someone came through with a wheelbarrow because they were like really bringing rubble outside of it, they walked by me and then they opened the door. And so I really had to throw myself <laughs> over those documents really to make them not fly <laughs> away. So the remnant of that uh, yeah, culture that sure. thousands of people participate in that was so important for like so many years and didn't mean anything afterwards anymore yeah because That's hardly strange, anyone right? remembers it yeah it had to be like protected by my little researcher's body like there <laughs> and I'm like what am I doing here yeah so so I really find that really fascinating to talk about also mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. how how I really resented that moment yeah that I had to it was cold there and I was like really like but 
I eventually happy that it happened because it forced me to face something and mm -hmm. go back mm -hmm. to the, the importance mm -hmm. of like the, those people participating in them and really what they were trying to do with dance, what they were mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. to eventually produce out of their engagement with that physicality mm -hmm. and and so and i found that valuable it's not necessarily a question for anyone <laughs> but it's more like to think through i just chiming with that kind of a moment um the periods that i'm thinking about for that project i also think about contemporary work and future work um uh, but the book project is a, is a historical one, and it's a period of massive and systemic crises that include um, climate crisis and include the emergence of slavery and include the uh, early history of colonization. When I was doing part of the work, we were also like looking at whether or not one of the texts had been censored. So different approaches to that. Ultimately, they dismantled the book, put it in water, <laughs> and peeled it apart. And you know, I'm looking now at what was under that. Um, but similarly, in the collection, um, there are just like these huge labor movements everywhere, but they include libraries. And so the librarians came through like banging on pots and pens and making noise. And, and so there's just this sense that, you know, sure, there's the illusion that these things are stable, but they're not. The labor in them is also undergoing these like massive pressures. And then even going back, you know, three days this summer trying to kind of reassemble some of this after COVID is, uh, you know, a real Rubik's cube. Um, but, you know, going back and uh, so many of the rules have changed now, you can only see five things. And, you know, the, the, the pressures that they've been on under the ideas of what kinds of labor are essential, all of those play out within all of our knowledge institutions. So, you know, that kind of push and pull, as you're saying, mm -hmm is palpable people are yelling and screaming in the library because you know <laughs> i mean it's also france but like in that case um because because there there are labor questions shooting through the whole of our society and um we really need to pay attention to them if i could just maybe jump in um one thing i'm hearing is this kind of like imaginary where on the one side is writing and it's like this fixed dry you know pencil pencil on the paper kind of an act um that somehow feels more permanent and maybe legit it gets legitimated in institutions like this in a different kind of way and then on the other hand there's performance right like as if there's this great divide but we know that when we think about writing um by which we also mean reading because because there's no you know and reading is a performative act in the here and now no matter what the archive tells us what we do is like kick the archive and make it live today right that's our role and I so I think that we need to think about writing in sort of messier terms and we also oh, need to I think do. about performance in terms of the kind mm -hmm. of orality you're speaking to yeah. right so I work a lot with oral histories and and they're just exquisite like the stuff people say what they remember and the terms that they use are so uh, deep and vivid and interesting mm -hmm. um and they perform so i think you know i just want to kind of fudge yeah, the line no, between these yeah, two I zones do. if i can in terms of that as well i think that um uh it's a connection back to the conversation um the that we had this morning talking to Mark, but you know, the if somebody had asked me to write a book about my technical stuff, there's no way I would have gotten to the kind of language that emerged uh, out of my body as I taught. Right. So and it's not to say somebody else should write the book, but the, <laughs> just kidding. But the but but I do think, it, you know, it's really interesting if I think in terms of forms of archiving um, and the role of language in there, the, the transmission is key. And the, the, so the, the language emerges from a particular context, how the, the transmission of that language is key. So whether that's written or spoken or on a video, you know, the, so that's the thing that we get. For me, it's really, you know, like the, the, 
what are our opportunities to read and what forms do they take? You know, I mean, it can be written language, but I think it's, as I really think in terms of archivi archivization, I, I, I'm, I'm, again, I want to resist the forms that colonialism have taught us. I want to resist those. We're in an institution, not just this one. Universities come from enlightenment, you know, that's Eurocentric ideals, very specific socio cultural, economic, and political context. So I don't want to think of archivization only in the context of what's written down. You know, I want to think it differently. I want to think it obliquely. I want to think, um, yeah, there's something in this idea of the oblique, you know, that, that, is, of, that is of interest to me. I mean, thinking about the archives, uh, and again, it's, it's this, the moment that something is archived is a selection process. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and already there, I mean, can, it can be very critical about what is archived and what is kept out of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's another moment where the similar kind of problematic of is when how the archive is accessible and to whom it is accessible, and then what that person chooses to reactualize. Um, and if I even look at the short history that I've lived myself within European contemporary dance from the 1980s until now, there's so much that is lost. Uh, if you just look at Flemish dance, which has this kind of huge reputation, but the only people who have been able to archive it who has, are, are the bigger companies, the bigger mm -hmm. artists mm -hmm. that had the, the money to create their own archives. I have a huge archive myself on VHS and DVD that technologically is not surviving anymore. And there's also no way to find the support. That, so there's, um, yeah, I'm thinking a lot about, uh, yeah, I think one of the most critical questions that we have to ask today about archives is what is not there and what is missing. And, and this is at all levels of, uh, uh, yeah, because it's very, yeah, it's very yeah. limited. What, yeah, what extremely, is, extremely. But, oh. Just quickly, um, I mean, for me, one of the things I'm really sort of facing and struggling with is like the documentation of the piece versus the documentation of how the piece was made and like how lost that is. And like in a Canadian context, how lost that is um, and how few documents we have of how choreographers are making their work and then how that leaves young choreographers in the dark. Right. And and then also there's a political part of this, which is that as choreographers, our lives are so precarious that I think we feel like we have to protect our secrets, you know, and oh, that's interesting. yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's different, but with the generation I came up with, we were very generous with each other in some ways, but it almost felt like the way we worked was kept secret from each other. Um, and I think it's because our lives were so precarious that it was very hard to share how we did what we did. Um, and also what we did felt so precious, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think this is very interesting, like what does it mean to share how you do with people and trust that no one will do it the way you do it? Like I could tell you exactly how I make a piece and you could follow that formula. It won't look anything like what I do because you are you and I am me, you know? Um, so yeah, that's all I want to say about that. I wanted to um, actually going a little bit in that direction, but also like, I think what makes people not say it's also competition um, and yeah, uh, capitalization exactly. over signatures yeah, and yeah. you know like authorship. So this is this is plays a big yeah. role I think in in, in terms of transmission. Um, but I very much agree with the how, and I think the how is maybe what can enable. Um, and knowledge transmission in, in, in terms of pedagogy as well. So how do you do that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the what and the why, which are very important, of course, but 
how 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 do people do um, and uh, so in a pass uh, we stimulated a lot this kind of uh, publications that will come as a company accompaniments of processes so publishing process instead of publishing conclusions which is this is also a certain paradigm right like we just publish when you know and i mean what do you know you know <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so, like the, this, this question of yeah, which I think it's very inherent also in choreography and dance, dance and also art, art practice. You know, in a way, it's that these don't know, and many like, how do I get to address those questions that I'm interested in, right? And what what does that do? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So this this kind of publishing in terms of um, naming and understanding the the process of inquiry. And to stay there, I mean, I think uh, actually mentioned this this morning as well. I think it's extremely important to remain there and to not come to the I know or someone else knows because this is also a question. It's like who is writing for you, right, mm -hmm. or about you? Who 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 are the who are the voices that are actually naming what one has done or how one has done? This is also I think something interesting. It's like on how even though choreographers and dancers. There is this uh, idea that we cannot talk, right? Or we cannot write, <laughs> or maybe mm -hmm. we, we betray ourselves by writing and talking because this is there is some es essence that is lost. There is also an articulation that I think it's very very interesting uh, by that maybe mistalking other languages, you just, like the specificity of the language that is actually mm -hmm. or sounds or whatever is there as as the language of transmission. It's a small example, and I'm thinking of that a great deal. And I think we can write together. I mean, that's, I think, another part of it. The stabilization of one or the other is a bit of an invention. And you know, we can unpack that, I think. You know, um, uh, it, there, there are labors that can be shared. Um, but I'm also thinking of things like, you know, tack, tack, tack. Like, how often are people moving like tack, tack, tack? And you can even see it in video sometimes you can see people making these kinds of sounds and then they're, they're kind of relatively culturally specific sometimes sometimes not. Um, and so these these ways that um, you know you talked about the 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 sonic another word is fatic like how does the material quality of words and sound translate to emotion. Um, you know, the capacities from poetry onwards of the ways these communicate and score um, are a kind of superpower for the possible <laughs> conversation between these different modalities. And I'm super interested in why they could disrupt each other, you know? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a negative disruption. It could be on the table too. Okay, I'm just gonna put my bias out here none of this exists without performance and that's a lowercase performance that includes all the things that where dance operates and dance is everywhere which is kind of why it's magic and why we're here right yeah. we see it in our mother cooking right and the techniques of the body required to produce that thing mm -hmm. there's dance there when i talk to like amazing performers about where they found, where they discovered themselves. They talk about their dad, who was a construction laborer, yeah, sure. and watching him move. Um, so, which is just to say that I think we're, um, and this might be like a really kind of old school way to think of it, but we're we're in, as writers, we're in the shadow of of something. Um, whatever we're writing about, whether we're writing about a demo in the student uh, protests that happened, whether we're writing about uh, a dancer of, you know, local uh, cultural significance, whether we're writing about um, whatever we're writing about, it's, it's in dialogue closely with life and movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's the challenge. But, you know, I, I also think like there's a way to look at writing like fish wrap. Right, like that's what, when when I worked at a newspaper, they would always say, "Remember, it's fish wrap, it's gone, it's ephemeral too. Nobody's yeah. going to come." You know, so I think, yes, it's powerful and it endures, but other things endure too. We know that the legacy, right? Like people remember um, Catherine Dunham's work maybe more than they remember the folks who wrote about her. 
Uh, they were, you know, so I mean, mm -hmm. I think we need to balance this kind of thing and, and see the ways that inscription and modes of inscription are always entwined with Absolutely. life itself and with yeah. performance and um, and uh, to kind of till the, the sort of power and joy in that rather than to get into the sort of either or like which, you know, um, and I would just say one little like tiny footnote is I'm working on a piece right now about a choreographer who wanted to make a score because they wanted to escape the kind of control or authorship or authority of the great choreographers. So they created this score. The score becomes a site of interpretation for the collective. The collective makes the dance and it's kind of related to the score, but kind of not because it's already many steps removed through interpretation, the archive of the body, et cetera. Um, and then one of those performers makes a drawing so he can remember the dancing that he's supposed to do. So we're right back into, you know, and then mm -hmm. along comes MJ to look at the drawing and go, holy shit, this is dance, but it's writing, but it's, you know, so it's, it's all so much more entwined, I think, um, but mm -hmm. none of it happens without the performance. No, so, you know, that's what's thrilling and that's... No. I mean, the, 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 to bounce off of what you just said, MJ, I think that the, you know, yeah, like you said, the legacy survives. And the legacy takes different forms and whether it ends up being drawn, um, uh, which I think is extraordinary, we saw it in the um, your, your um, some of the publications from Espace Perrault, um, the, the visual and it, you know there's it's something that we have talked about as well, the the with Espace Perrault, not in relationship to this project, but to other projects, where wh what does documentation look like and sometimes you know, even experiences uh, in rehearsal processes, et cetera, where, you know, it's, it's, the video is not necessarily the most loyal representation. A photograph speaks more, so, ironically, and maybe a drawing even more, you know what I mean? The, the, what is, how do we, the space in between is actually the space of potential and how we activate that and keep it um, nourished and alive is for me a key uh, uh, facet aspect of effective documentation, quote unquote, you know, and, and, I, and, and recognizing that some things will never be other than the space in between. And that's okay. That's, that's, it's good even, you know, it's not, it's not to be challenged. You know, I think, yeah. Go. <laughs> Just one thing. <laughs> Just thinking at, uh, about like on how um, how to open spaces for to re-encounter that. You know, like uh, what kinds of uh, not just archivization, but also how to make the archivization uh, public. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, what kind? I mean, I guess this one is one, right? Mm -hmm. But like, uh, yeah, like hearing you talking, I was also thinking about reenactment, or I mean, how do you bring that alive? Not the talking, maybe about that, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. or or not either. Or I don't, I don't mean to, uh, no, I don't, to I don't want binary. to do this no, thing sure. at all. Uh, yeah, but like all that, the the that other experience also could come in. I still didn't go to the to the library here. I also didn't go to Espace Peru, <laughs> so I mean this is. Uh, but I'm quite interested in to see like what kind of this uh, the experiences can be held in these spaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, can be something exciting too. But I think, think also the the the. You know, it's it's. How do I say it? In I experience my in between. It's the same thing we we're talking about in teaching of the technique class. So the the. My, my exploration is about where are the spaces in my body and how do I navigate those spaces to generate movement. Somebody else learns it and the first thing I'm going to say to them is look for the spaces in your body. They're not the same as mine. They are never, we are nevertheless together in a, 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 an exploration of the in-between. So in a way it's not, for me it's not about you know, even when I work with grad students here around 
you know, research creation, practice-based research, et cetera. Yeah, we all need to eventually write it down. But the, the, what I'm really interested in, there's so much that needs to happen before you do this. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's traverse the body, traverse the body exploration of those spaces in between, which will be different for everybody. And I think that there's something, I mean, Guy in the work that you've done in terms of the body as archive as well, it's, those are cultural spaces, those are political spaces, socially inscribed, some of them, you know what I mean? It's like, and I'm interested in how we, yeah, how we pull things apart to have access to that kind of thing not in a sense of um what was the word you used vk stable stabilizing it you know not in a sense of wanting to fix it um perhaps not even in a sense of wanting to understand it but to acknowledge it to experience it to you know be in that collective exploration of those you know places of potential i think yeah, I'm, I'm really interested also in this in between um, there, especially w when that in between is also created through a fictionalized uh, approach towards it. Yeah, so not uh, attempting to resurrect a past and then mm -hmm. then yeah. making decisions about what is real about it or not, but actually creating spaces that are allowing a certain kind of in between between something that we are unearthing, rethinking, bringing back or so, but also where we are uh, uh, creatively recreating something in relation to that. I'm thinking of the work of, of Trajal Haral um, mm -hmm. and when he combines two cultures that not really engage with each other due to temporal and physical, but also most important uh, uh, racialized uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, differences. And so, um, and that he, and, and critically in, in, enabled an encounter that actually never occurred and that then allowed us to rethink what what is the selection process and that is also something that goes back to what you said this morning about the the issue of like the the privilege and and the the rigor of like some of those selection processes and where do we resist a capitalist notion of selection um that is is like um yeah. given to us or the under which we are working and under um and which we are trying to challenge also at a certain point where that allows us really to go to spaces that have not been explored mm -hmm. with this kind of work and, and create really something new in that moment and not just reflect on the past, but rather go forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and hearing you on that, and at the same time, there are scripts and scores and works we don't want to reenact. I mean, that's another part too, that they're filled with the generation of, of of stereotypes and of um, quite vile representation, whether that's of disability or race or gender, and you know, consistently so. And so for me, that's also been, you know, as somebody who looks at some of that material, you know, the desire to reenact is dangerous sometimes. And I'm not saying you must not, but like, what does it mean to engage with legacies without a desire to remake them at all? Um, in fact, to expose the codes and to make sure that there's a kind of documentation for things that haven't made the narrative but are in the archive. Um, and that's quite a bit of stuff too. And so I think, you know, the, 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 go, the plan to go somewhere new and create or the plan to reenact, it sometimes I think can, can like borrow from models of loss that well, you can maybe think about in ways of um, re-engagement and repair and interruption um, and refusal uh, productively as well. That you know the the ugliness that's in the archive and the uh, and the ugliness that's within performance culture also is part of the world that we're, or at least that I'm um, in a, a dialogue with when it comes to archive. Um, I mean, sort of, but I'm just thinking about like opacity and the right to be opaque, like the right to be misunderstood, or the, mm -hmm. the, the right that the pathway through your body is not something that everybody should have access to, you know, and, and that these pathways can be sacred and private. And that's 
I don't know, I think sometimes when things are sacred and private, we think of it as knowledge lost or like something disappearing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like it's carrying on in all these other ways. It's it's transpiring out in directions in all these other ways. And I know sacred is like a fraught word for some people, but I, I do think there's like a right to the sacred and a right to the private that can be really interesting when we think about archives. Mm -hmm. um, because oftentimes when I think of archives, I think of digging, right? And mm -hmm the right to remain undug mm -hmm. is for me like a really but interesting just idea to, just to be clear i want i am not at all suggesting that it needs to be public yeah right it that's a it's a personal pathway um the what happens with it beyond that is is this a different thing you know I, mean, I can very much relate to what sasha was saying like i mean again my last book which was like all dealing with all with artists who had used a pers very personal mourning process as a main source of inspiration for a new work i was i, had, I was all, all the time asking them permission even if i knew all the details of the personal story how much do you, uh, will you allow me to share for a larger public including my own story as far as it involved other people that I'm close to, like my mother, or my family, like that. So I, I think it is also, I mean, there's also a right of, of keeping mm -hmm. part of the archive, not accessible mm -hmm. like that, uh, private archive. I want to come back to, there was something about, I think we're circling around, and this was also this morning for me, the, the main interest. And, and I think what Espas Perot is, is um, already realizing today, and, and also other initiatives much more than maybe 10 or 20 years ago, is that the way that we archive creative practices, today there's a much larger plurality of forms um, than there used to be, and, and it can only, I mean, also what you said, like, I want more of everything. And it's also, what the other positive aspect is also that it's a plurality of voices, um, that it's not any longer only the choreographer um, voice being documented, but also the dancers. I mean, as a dramaturg, I always thinking I'm witness. I'm the witness of somebody else's creative process, and as a witness, my my memory of that process, my archive, is completely different, complementary yeah. to the person's itself. And it's not that one of these memories is better or wrong or, or worse, but it's just to have these two voices dialogue with each mm -hmm. other, that makes um, then the potential of the sharing uh, just richer. And the last, again, as an example, one of the artistic projects I was involved with um, the past decade, which I enjoyed most, um, is a project by a German choreographer called Stephanie Tiersch, and the project is called The Memory Machine. And again, she had this very simple idea to document archive the recent history and she was only looking back the 1980s 1990s and this was we made the project maybe around 2010 and we, we are documenting it through the oral memory and history of everyone who was involved uh, choreographers critics academics uh, producers presenters in the collecting the materials she had this great idea instead of interviewing people individually, we bring people around the table with three or four and we, we let them discuss and we frame it. We had, we had a very specific strategy, talk about movements, talk about people, talk about works. Uh, we recorded these conversations and a lot of these conversations was about, I remember that and the other person saying, even if the other person was, it was about her work, it was not like that at all. Uh, so the complete subjectivity and the complementarity of these memories. And then we cut up, this, we, we cut up all the material in, in a very fragmented way. And we created these machines where the audience could recompose <laughs> with, from the fragments, uh, their own uh, oral history. Uh, and it was, again, the audience was often people who had also still an exp personal experience of the work that was discussed or that. Um, so there was something, so in, in that particular case, that artistic form of an installation 
and also the process of, of documenting archiving in an artistic way was so rich and, uh, and pleasurable because that was, was a lot of pleasure as well like in, in the uh, so this yeah, I think we're in a fortunate time that we can imagine different forms and we are including many more voices now than, than we used to and it's still not enough and there's still voices missing but I think I'm very positive about it at the same time it actually, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It brings me back to the issue of, of control over narratives and, and mm -hmm. control over material. Also, um, I was writing recently about uh, my father was displaced after World War II, and I was writing about the experience there, a little trigger warning. Um, um, he had to leave with his mother and his sister, and they had to hide the sister out what is now Poland, while the Soviet army moved in and they hid the sister in, in a, a cart in order for her not to get raped. And, and so I, I, I was like, remember my father telling me about these uh, um, uh, journeys there. And then I, I wrote about it and, and, and asked my brother if he remembers uh, that my brother had a completely different uh, memory of that um, uh, instance and then that narrative. And, and really, um, it was radically different. And we both insisted on our conversation with uh, my father, which he hardly ever had because it was a past that he hardly ever talked about. Um, and, and so I was really, my father's dead, so he has no control over um, um, that narrative anymore. And I feel like that is also something that is very important for artists also. So I'm wondering, like in, in the work that you have been doing, how you deal with the, the work of controlling a narrative of, of people who are still Um, so it's, it's related to what I said before. So like the empower, empowering the artists actually to speak their own language and to, to frame the work the way, the way they want to, to do so. Um, and I think this comes from the demand more and more academic demand of explaining the work that the pressure that is there around the arts. Um, uh, so one needs to do that. I mean, also to, to apply for and yes, all this. I mean, there is a whole lot of so. Like, how do you how do you um, empower the artists to speak their own language, basically, and to own their own their own history, their own mm -hmm. process, their own intentions, their own you know, like from where they are speaking. So yeah, I mean, there's many support structures in order to, but I think it's more even maybe a way of thinking about it mm -hmm. than anything else. So like, how do we empower, I mean, also all these students here <laughs> to, to, to speak their own language, right? And, and, and it's not a question of authorship, it's a question of like understanding the knowledge that one has mm -hmm. because one does. And so it, 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 it makes something, right? And so how to empower that instead of, uh, um, being like at the mercy of whatever yeah, trends, uh, um, the, the economy. I mean, we are always this. Is, it's not. I'm, I'm. I'm not blind, but but like, yeah. It's an empower yeah. empower um, intention. If I can, with that as well, it makes me think, uh, uh, Sasha, of what you were talking about in terms of opacity, because if the artist is empowered to speak their own language, then they also determine what is revealed, what is not, and how. And that's for me one of the reasons why it is so important that, you know, I mean, many of you may have heard various of your teachers, including myself, say, yeah, you need to learn to write, you need to learn to articulate what you do. It can't rely on somebody else to talk about what you do. You have to learn to do that yourself. And that's a place of agency. You know, that way you determine your, your, your framework, your boundaries, the priorities inside of that. A reviewer may, you know, they'll see what they see, they'll say what they say. But when there is something, when the work needs to speak, it means the artist needs to speak. Yes. You know? And I mean, and the, again, this language is very varied, right? Very there is varied. no way yeah. to, there is no right way no. to no. do this. Yeah. It's also important to think about the institutional responsibility towards that process and to enable that yeah, process and, and to enable many different ways of, of, of fostering the process and, and, and continuing it and, and then also um, to let certain things go that, that were 
uh, a regular practice and are no longer uh, appropriate for that process. I mean, so many layers with that, but we're also in this moment of technological shift. Like we're speaking now, but it's already archiving as we do, right? And so that idea that there's a delegation or that we're not in this field, especially with COVID happening and the technologies becoming so readily available, they already were. But, you know, I remember in graduate school saying, well, I don't know, I learned a whole bunch of rep from video. And like, I think this is more complicated. And that's just sort of being like a sidebar question. I don't think these are sidebar questions anymore. Mm -hmm. The mediation of archive alongside all, all of those practices, the ways those are deployed in the work, on the stage, in the dialogue, in the making process, you know, all of it is kind of simmering and agitating um and available for these decisions right available for these questions of what's shared do you do record the private conversation the difficult one do you not i mean we've seen such strange examples of that in the last few years um and so yeah i think on the one hand uh there has been an understanding of the tools of writing being in particular uh hands but i i just don't think that's what we're in some ways seeing in this explosion of digital, mobile, recordable, repeatable forms. And so we were also in a moment of shifting, not always in predictable ways, and certainly, you know, with all of the questions of fake news, you know, potentially quite damaging ones, ways in which we can think about what an archive does. No, I was actually going to, I was going to go slightly somewhere else. So, no, I mean, no, as, a, as a bridge, um, um, really thinking about, um, uh, it's a combination of what um, MJ, you know, when you talk about performance, and uh, again, I mentioned your, your work, Guy, uh, uh, on the body as archive, you know, I mean, and you, you interviewed uh, Akram and, and Larby, but it's, your interest is beyond those two individuals, you know what I mean? And, for me, the the both as performer, certainly as dramaturg as well, but uh, and teacher, this this idea of the 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 body constantly archiving, um, and how that is informing, you know, what emerges, and I think you know even if I the 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 solo I just performed last um, fall, well no last year, anyways, Confession Publique, one of the one of the moments of orality that I was talking about after afterwards, because I ultimately need to write about it, um, I ended up out of nowhere, my grandmother appeared. And I realized there had been people who had said to me, yeah, but there are like layers of women that emerge from this thing, you know, and I thought, oh, yeah, okay. And then me talking through it, like talking through talking myself through the piece. The, there she was, Winnie, her name was. And as, as I, I, you know, as she manifested, you know, I mean, really in my thinking, not just as some kind of, you know, astral projection or something, because she's well dead. It's been a long time. Um, that I realized, yeah, but in fact, what did I archive as a child that then reemerges through, that is in that solo, that is now in my thinking, that I can articulate here, um, and it was really interesting. That's just my own personal story, but of course, the, I'm archiving all kinds of things in this in this instrument all the time, you know. And to to the when I think of uh, again related to social inscription and that kind of thing, what am I? I mentioned my own background, the you know Jamaican folk dances, etc. And there was a time when yeah, you. you it was part of my personal archive that was, you know, you're like, no, no, I didn't do that, you know? And w when in fact it informed me deeply. And so it's also interesting for me to think, how do we um, encourage and take advantage of the activation of our own archives in the work that we're doing, you know? And, and for me, and, and you said it yourself this morning, like, and I'm quoting you, learning through teaching. Mm -hmm. I think teaching has also been my own 
uh, best way to activate your own archive mm -hmm. um, in the way that uh, my original yoga teacher also said like the, the difference between a, a good teacher and a student is just that the teacher maybe being a little bit older and having a little bit more experiences know much you know faster what you get what you can learn from the other because wow. you're both in a learning process um, and it's and that's why then the, yeah. I mean the project of documenting the, the teaching practice not to fix it mm -hmm. and, or label it but allowing it to to transform um, is so uh, is so important like that and I also again I feel like when I'm when I'm teaching something whether it's a, a more practice or it's more theoretical uh, i'm revisiting my own yeah. memory my own archive sometimes i need um a book <laughs> to, tools outside of me to uh, to to remember mm -hmm. uh but i'm practicing the actualization mm -hmm. of whatever kind of information knowledge that is stored like that absolutely um you know. <laughs> Oh, I mean, just to like build on that, it's like, from what I hear you saying, it's kind of like, you're doing the archive and the archive is doing you. Absolutely. And it's, it's doing this. And I like, I know some people, like, I don't know how people who are in the program right now, like where you're at, but I remember when I was in the program in first and second and third year, I was like, I don't want to think about the archive. Like I'm punk, like I'm doing a new thing but the archive was doing me the whole time like punk was doing me the whole time <laughs> you know so yeah just to say that like whether or not you want to engage with the archive mm -hmm. the archive is doing you anyway so you might as well engage with it <laughs> oh, yeah danielle here grab a microphone this is so great so many different ways of knowing and knowledges at this table and just taking the moment to like it's a fresh moment for the department for the students and um it's really cool to see like all the different generations here who i have, have the privilege of getting to know and interact with and my question is i'm thinking as a phd student in an interdisciplinary field but very immersed in the dance program as my home um what is like a visions many visions a multiplicity of visions moving forward in this moment of like alchemizing many different types of knowledge systems for these folks coming up into the world as artists in dialogue with all of the knowledges that you are bringing and sharing like this alchemy of like this moment where what can dance do at concordia like specifically in the dance department as part of the university, as part of the community of Montreal and beyond in this digital time. But what can dance do? So how do we actually make space for many voices existing within the reality of the university and the structures and the different voices and needs and desires? But what does that look like? So what is that? Uh, what are the spaces that are produced or generated as a community at whole that like the dance department, what does dance even mean nowadays in universities when they're closing down, they're getting less funding, they're, they're being made, uh, they're merging with other departments, but what can this department do, and I mean this department, all of us, to like make that space and to generate something new or to soften the grounds or the divisions or uh, are there any, I'm just curious from all of you up here, like what could that do? What could that look your like? question? No. <laughs> I mean, instead of, of uh, answering the question is maybe something to put towards the room. So to leave it in as a question in the room and, and thank you for actually opening up that um, round table towards the room. Um, so I think it's a really important question, but it's not a question that is answerable by, by any of us. Yeah. So, but at the same time, 
we do need to be aware of the institutional power that we have, yeah? um, that we are uh, enabled to make certain decisions about that process and what that means and what that power also, how it's wielded. Yeah? So, but then on the other hand, and that was the question that I actually wanted to put towards Angelique as well, is like, where is dance also going into other areas? Yeah? So how is like your dance work that we heard so much about this morning, yeah? also informing the, the work on the task force, the, the special mm -hmm. advisory, and those kind of works that from the outset do not look like dance yeah, work no, originally, no. but it's it's of course informing that work. Of so, course. and I'm, 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 I think it's really important also to talk about where are we taking dance into areas that do not look dance -y, but they are still highly choreographed and, 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 and come with all the mm -hmm. power structures mm -hmm. of choreography and all the, the, the necessities of improvisation and so yeah. on. I mean, if I can speak to that uh, relatively briefly, I mean, I think that the, the, there's no doubt in my mind um, that I would not have been able to accomplish what I've accomplished um, with the President's Task Force on Anti-Black Racism and as Special Advisor to the Provost had I not been a dancer. I would, I mean, I don't, um, you know, you're absolutely right. I think in my mind as well, it would have been somebody in sociology or communication studies or political science or, you know, that kind of thing. But I realized quite quickly that there are two things that I think are important. One is the fact that I don't come from academia. And so not coming from academia also means that I have a very different relationship with the structures of academia. I am, I'm, I mean this, and I don't mean it to sound, you know, the, the facetious or pretentious or anything like that, but ultimately working in the university for me is an unanticipated bonus at the end of a dance career, right? So the, the, for me, there's, there's, I don't step into academia thinking, okay, this is the beginning of something that I need to attain. I'm in here, I'm in here, okay, so what do I do with it? Right, so it starts there, um, but then I think the 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 because it starts there, then what do I do with it? It's, I you know, once it became necessary for that work to happen, um, or it became clear that you know I was in the position to do so, I think the craft of improvisation, the craft of you know, exactly what I talked about this morning. Find the space in your body find the space in the bodies. If it doesn't work here, how do you shift? Don't, don't push, but really shift. Find the other uh, appui dans le corps pour pouvoir prendre le poids ailleurs. You know, like pick it, that, that, that's really what um, has happened physically for me in the work over the past now three years. And I think as well that the other thing that is key to that is that the that comes out of the, the the just my experience as a dancer, whether it's teaching, performing, dramaturging, whatever, is also the the fact that I have worked predominantly in cases where hierarchies are not so marked. And when they have been, there have been issues. I have stepped away if I have needed to, or you know, I mean, situations that come to crunch, whatever. But the there has you know, I, my colleagues could be 20 years old, they could be 70 years old. They're colleagues, equal footing. So that also meant that I engage in the institution differently. I've had to learn, perhaps not to be friends with my students, you know what I mean? And at the same time, I still want to meet them as equals. I mean, those of you I've taught, you've all heard me say, I'm not interested in teaching students, and I'm not. I really am not. I'm interested in meeting young artists. Yes. So if we meet there, but that's immediately a, a relationship that is um, less hierarchical. I, I mean, recognizes differences in experience, you know, having lived a little bit longer, done it a little bit more, but that we meet in that place, almost a place of, um, yeah, I suppose more like master and apprentice would be kind of thing rather than this teacher student thing. I know and you don't. 
But I think the, the, that also influenced very strongly the ways in which I was able to engage with upper administration, you know, all the different levels inside of the university. And, and then the other piece that is critical is just a relationship to my own body. So what I was saying earlier, how do you make, I know what bodies were not in the room when I danced, right? So, yeah. I'm not part of Concordia, so I can't talk for the for the but department. But still dance pedagogue. But um, you no, know, a couple of years ago, uh, I was in, uh, involved in the conceptualization of a European-funded project between three major uh, dance uh, higher institutions in Europe, uh, and the, the idea of the focus was exactly that. What Jens and Angelica are referring to is to acknowledge all these transferable skills uh, that, that dancers have, the skill of improvisation, skill to collaborate. Sometimes they've learned it with trial and error, but uh, the skill. Um, and again, historically, these skills were kind of activated at the end of an active career, yeah. Yeah, when there's a moment of transition. But the project that we tried to realize in Europe, and we were able to do it for about three years, was to already bring that awareness in the first year of undergraduate studies. Not telling people you already have to think about doing something else. You came here because you want to dance and you want to be on stage, that's absolutely fine. But the techniques that you learn, they're more than just dance techniques. They're, they're skills that are actually so, so in the future, when you're ready for it, or when it's your desire, you will be able to activate in mm -hmm. completely different fields. Um, and it was just by giving a lot of like, examples of people who have done that somewhere in their journey um, and share that already at the, like, in the beginning of, of, a, of the training and the career, that this is also possible. Um, and it's, for instance, one of the skills that in all the interviews we did that came like, it's the rigor, like, absolutely, <laughs> the rigor that, I mean, is highly in demand, like, you know, I mean, because it's lacking in our society, the skill of collaboration is highly in demand, because it's lacking in our society. Uh, so, so there's also something about I think part of our of, of the institution is to, um, to create awareness early on uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that further on in the path there are much more applications than than just uh, being a highly skilled dancer on the stage yeah. i mean i think that i have just one last thing that the other the other um, um elements that i can attest to in a way one is adaptability as well a capacity to adapt and that's not just improvisation but really a capacity to adapt um, uh, and the other is gone. <laughs> Capacity risk. to adapt. Huh? Risk. risk as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. But there is another one that I had in mind. It'll come back if, it, if it's supposed to. I'm not speaking for the department, but, you know, as somebody who in conservatory training Capacity got injured. Can you say that again, please? Sure. I, sorry, I I was watching over here. Somebody who in conservatory training got injured, that the things that cause you to adapt don't change every part of you, right? Like if, if a limb or a, the stabilization of certain muscles is shifted, it doesn't stop the mind and the engagement with all of those things. And I I'm, do feel very strongly in terms of institutions or in, in pedagogies that they I wish to advocate for porosity at all of those levels so yes it may be an activating into mathematics it may mean activating mm -hmm. into design um and it may be, I mean there's somebody on the radio, I think YouTube or something into NASA like I mean that's what people are doing and they can do it and so finding the ways in which there can be an elasticity and support in the community because a lot of the people who go through these trajectories are in part of a trajectory 
Um, and maybe all of it, like maybe thinking about NASA and space flight requires choreographic thinking too. I, I remembered the thing that I forgot. Okay. No, and it's just, you mentioned NASA, funny how that would work, but anyways. No, but it's, 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 um, it's uh, uh, learning the rigor of nonlinear thinking. I just want to add one thing, which is um, just in terms of the question, um, I've gotten to see you in many different kinds of rooms in this institution. And one of the things I think you bring um, are performance chops. Um, you're a generous performer. And so I see you in front of all kinds of audiences, um, really different audiences with different capacities and facilities and, and gifts, and you are able to communicate. And in all kinds of ways, you stand up in the, a room like this, full of folks, some who know you, some who don't, and communicate uh, the project of the task force. And, um, and that performance resonates. So the skill, you know, the, all that experience, it's right there. Um, but there was a question. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, talking about archiving and oral history and moving things into written text brings up a lot of questions that I think are, are really prominent right now in, in the art world uh, around around the way that things have been archived in the past, particularly like for indigenous nations and stuff being stuck in museums and people not being able to get that out so that their histories can transform and change. And I'm just wondering, because I find that these issues, uh, they, they're hard to just weave through. And, and it, it makes me think of like one of the grandfather teachings of courage and how sometimes you have to, to be brave even when the consequences are uh, not desirable. And what is maybe our role um, in a place of privilege in universities as dancers thinking about archiving um, in trying to change those violent uh, tactics that have been used in the past and are still being used today, or just if you have any thoughts in that world of, of stuff at all. M might I, uh, yeah, I'll say this and then I'll, I, I don't want to go deeply into it myself. You'll understand why shortly. Um, the, the, I learned as well um, at various points, I think, during my career, but um, that it was important that it was a black woman doing what I was doing. It still is. I can stop there. I, I would just jump in and say, um, uh, you know, my, I come out of a performance, my academic training was in performance studies. And before that, I was a waitress and a journalist. And before that, years ago, I aspired to dance. Um, um, and what I would say about the message of performance, which I, I feel so moved by and I carry with me all the time is, um, is it's a kind of a category busting term. It's about um, acknowledging and, and in a sense, knowing or maybe unknowing is what I mean. But it's about, um, for me, the message of, of the folks I know in dance and the message of performance studies or, or performance more broadly is something about, um, it's something about thinking, it, it, it's always about a counter archive. It's always about the body archive. And, and um, when those lessons are so close, in a sense, that um, I really believe that your training as a dancer will, will bring that perspective into those meetings uh, when, when crazy ideas come up, and they do. 
people have ideas about how an archive should be formed or what should be in it. And, you know, um, you'll be that dancer at the table that says, wait a second, um, documents are performative or who's not at this table. Um, and so um, I think the lessons about uh, ephemerality, about bodily traces, about, um, I just think there's, there's a, a wide range of knowledges that are encased in performance traditions that then function to critique status quo that function to critique the stability of, um, of all kinds of authorities. Um, and, and that is the role is to move differently and to um, empower folks to move differently with you. Can I? I mean, just to try to touch on what you were saying about like doing the thing when the consequences of doing the thing I mean, it's mostly white people at this table. <laughs> I, I don't know, like it stood out to me. I don't know if it stood out to other people, but um, so I didn't know that. I don't know if I would have agreed to come if I had known that was gonna be the case, right? So my question is, it, it's not a question. I think that teachers who are white in institutions need to be willing to lose power, privilege, status, money, and like, that's a huge, that is a huge ask. I think putting yourself on the line is a huge ask, but um, to me, it's the only way, like, and I haven't figured that out because I wanna be a teacher and I love teaching. So like, what does it mean that I wanna take up this space, but maybe I am not the right person to take up the space. And I'm still, I don't have an answer to that question, but I'm still trying to work it out, but I really appreciate your question. And like, thank you for bringing it to the table. Um, the fact that I go back to the, the question of the archive, the fact that in the past things have been probably have been archived wrongly and voices have been left out, but that's that's what we have today. And then it's how do you again, the question is, how do you activate it? What is there and transform it? So that supports the transformation that we need in the present. Very concrete example. Uh, a very close friend of mine here in Montreal, Chanel Chagnon, she was part of this of uh, Fondation Jean Pierre Perrault, Espace Perrault. Uh, she was one of the first to archive the work of Perrault. She was a rehearsal, like a dancer, rehearsal director. She got passionate about archiving. She's retired now. She's still working in the archive of the Jesuits here in Montreal, which if you can talk about the wrong archive <laughs> or, or at least the wrong history, uh, but she's telling me, so she's, she's and, 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 and they're making, a, the Jesuits themselves, I mean, are investing a lot of money to um, make that archive accessible. And she says, some of the researchers most research that they have are people from indigenous backgrounds because they can find in that archive traces of their own culture that they can't find nowhere else anymore and then of course it's their their story uh, and they own that story and they bring other sources as well the oral history mm. what is what they carry embodied but it's then this the complementarity of these this wrong archive and its traces with the lift archive of the people that they need both in order to bring it to the next stage. So even the things from the past that are sometimes extremely negative, they can be used in a positive way. Like so. Uh, There's a, um, uh, I cheat in fact, cause I don't have to wait for that to go. So it's always an opportunity, let me just get in there. Um, no, but there's a there's an amazing quote from Chinua Achebe, and I don't even know if I'll remember it fully, but it's brilliant. And it's if the history of the hunt is only ever told by the hunter, then we never hear the lion speak. You know, something like that. It's it's fantastic. But the, you know, I think that the 
yeah, history has been told by the hunters. And I think even as we think, how do we change it? I think that's about everybody changing it. You know what I mean? So that we, we really make sure that we are actively seeking the voice of the lion to speak. A couple of thoughts on that. I remember walking into what used to be called the Museum of Man, it's the Musée du Quai Pony in Paris, and looking at all these um, objects and cases and thinking the vast majority of this is dance regalia in one form or other. They're masks, they're um, costumes, but th this is all dance related. <laughs> you know, it's not occasionally, it's like extensively, it's disproportionately so. So part of what I'm thinking about, and I do look at archives like the ones that you're talking about um, um, in the context of the Jesuits, right, is that not only is this disproportionately happening, but the category of performance is part of that, right? So not only to understand that the category of performance is part of it, but our ideas about the live are fundamental to it, which I think most of us mm -hmm. do know. Um, and so how having a genuine pluralism of the live and continuing to advocate for dance without always advocating for the category of performance um, and allowing all the tools to coexist but also be chosen amongst those and I would say also for the descendants of the hunter to disclose this right so part of working in a collection you know as I work with Jesuit archives amongst other things is, is to say this that, that there is an entangled cultural history there and not only is there an entangled cultural history but it's speaking of dance it's speaking of all of these categories and when we say these narratives like oh this european form arrives in the 1950s if it's like toronto national high school or whatever I, I don't know the narrative so well there are hundreds of years beforehand in which case this was absolutely there it's part of the collections of the materials that were seized then that are at the vatican now that are you know so it's it's absolutely foundational so i agree with you and the questions of repatriation and the ethics of them, I think, are the, the crucial ones. Yeah. Instead of finding really, um, unless there's another question, but instead of finding really an end to this, I think it's good to leave that also open as a question yeah, and, and, and continue a conversation about it and, and also um, uh, figure out um, possibilities of of really different perspectives on on an answer to this so um that's what i would like to do here um we are um thanking again uh for space for the opportunity to be here in this space and for organizing uh, a large part of, of this event um we are also uh, thanking again espace ferro um, uh, for their collaboration with us and the Interdisciplinary Studies uh, Center in Society and Culture. Um, we will have Zoe um, reintroduce um, the, um, the work again um, that is, is shown here. And I really encourage you to stay and, and, and look at the work again that is available now and will be available also in the future. And um, maybe... You yeah. Well, yeah, I actually wanted to make sure that, you know, you all got the chance to meet Emmanuel this morning. Um, the other partner in crime is Zoe Gold, who is now next to her, and there is no way this can end without. Get over here. That's great. You, yeah, you, you can sit if you want. You want to do this and you don't want to do no, this. And this sit? is fine. Yeah, kind of look at the people. I'm gonna look at the people. Hello. Or come where? Come over here. Come over here. Oh my goodness. And I can. I, I'll stay with you. How about that? Okay, great. Let's do that. I'll go over there. So I won't be saying anything that you haven't already heard today if you've been here. Um. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Jens and the dance department. 
for hosting the event in Fourth Space. Thanks to these amazing speakers for sharing some of your perspectives today. It's wonderful. It's an honor to be here. Um, Emmanuel and I did this thing. There's you saw it on the way in this incredible uh, table that is also a screen and we have screens at the back. I'm sure you've seen them. Um, what to say the the videos there are 17 videos that are I think I don't know if they're all playing today or if they've been yep they've all been playing since 10 a.m in a loop um, it's a lot it's a lot of material to to look at um, the videos are uh, the product of a several year long process um, I'll just quickly speak about what that process was and how it was sort of sparked in 2018, as adoring students of, of Angelique's, Emmanuel and I were like quite saddened and maybe disoriented um, to, to learn that Angelique was starting to think about phasing out her, her dance technique classes. Um, for us, the, the value of her pedagogical practice and her classes was just immeasurable and we felt activated we needed to jump into action in some way to to save to archive we couldn't let her classes disappear from our lives um because i think i mean i'm just going to be repeating things that have been said i am sure for us uh angelique's classes kind of came to represent something that was really basically quintessentially good about our choice to dance i would say um <clears throat> when angelique gave her master classes at circuest um they'd be there'd be so many people there there'd be pre-professional dancers active dancers retired dancers teachers choreographers um people that you really wouldn't see in any other dance classes in the city they would come out of the woodworks to be in the room with Angelique. Um, basically, I think for me, her classes were a gathering place, a multi-generational multi gathering place of people who like were engaged in an, in an embodied practice, working hard, gathered around someone who was, um, just so generously sharing her 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 work and it's a beautiful thing it's how she's teaching it's what she's teaching it's voila so it's it's resonated a lot in montreal and internationally and um yeah I mean, there's so there's so much to say about it. I know that you've already said it. How how Angelique's practice is at once very kinesthetically complex and and satisfying and intense in terms of its movement and choreography, as well as being musically complex in the continuity of her um, jazz singing and music practice, as well as being like advanced functional anatomy, um, exploring the physics of the body in motion, as well as being extremely extremely fun. So in the face of possibly losing these classes or not getting to do them with her, uh, the action that Emmanuel and I were able to get going was to um, initiate some partnerships with Espace Perrault, with Lise Gagnon and her amazing team, as well as at Centre Chorégraphique Circuest with Francine Gagné and her, her amazing team as well, as well as securing some support from the, from the Canada Council for the Arts to plan workshops. So we did three weeks of workshops at uh, Circuest. And we we invited Angelique to just share uh, what her work is about. And we invited guests, some sort of movement, dance, and, and music experts, if you will, including Neil Sachaski, an incredible um, functional anatomy and somatics practitioner, who dancer, choreographer, dramaturg, all of these things. Um, Melina Stinton, also a somatic practitioner, Pilates yoga teacher, incredible dancer. Tom Gossage, um, someone who's worked a lot with Angelique, as well as Charmaine Leblanc, uh, Tom and Charmaine being 
really incredible um, what is accompaniateur, accompanist, like specialized master. Yes, they they dance with their instruments completely. So they were in the room with us, as well as some other lovely people who who, who stopped by, um, dropping in and out. And we we documented every minute of our conversations and physical explorations, which resulted in quite a lot of footage uh, to deal with, and to, that was not easy to to wrangle. Um, we had Jonathan Inksetter, uh, who's a student here at Concordia, actually, as well as Frédéric Rivet, who was working. I don't know if she's still working. You no, know, was working with with Espace Perot, a very talented. A cinematographer, um, and and we now have these seventeen episodes. So I don't even know. I wrote a bunch more things, but I think it's not so. We we I we want to share them. They're on the internet. Um, <laughs> That's great. <it's laughs> Succinct. Good. Uh, the you'll see when we, we tried to give each episode uh, a title that will orient the viewer because they are they do we they follow the the chronology of our conversations and the conversations flowed Lord. they flowed in many directions and we didn't want to decontextualize this all of all of the richness of what was emerging so they're they have a sort of a central theme each episode, but they 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 wander a bit. They they're like coexisting with other concepts and themes, um, and and yeah, I mean some some are more more kind of pragmatic, very practical. We really can geek out on something biomechanical. Others are much more philosophical. Others are more about the how of um, how Angelique shares, how Angelique creates. It's very rich. It um, it's please enjoy. We're gonna post. We have, as you can see, I think it, this is searchable on the internet. I presume it's a Vimeo site. We'll also be posting it on our. We have a Facebook group, and soon all of these videos will be hosted on Espace Perot's website, which will feel much more official. So we're looking forward to that. Um, we hope it will be valuable. We hope it'll be a good tool. And I'll just take a tiny moment to thank a few people again, again and again. Uh, Neil Sachaski, well, Emmanuel, my collaborator Emmanuel, Neil Sachaski, Melina Stinton, Tom Gossage, Charmaine Leblanc, Kim De Jong, um, Morgan Lutiek, all the wonderful people who stopped by and participated in the classes. Um, at the conversations online and in person. Um, thanks to Frédéric Rivet and especially to Jonathan Inksetter for the many, many, many hours invested in the project. Thank you to the Canada Council and our partners, Circuit Espace Perot, especially Lise Gagnon and Francine Gagnier. And just wanting to take a tiny moment to thank Angelique herself for accepting to participate in the project because it was a lot of work. It was fun, but it was a lot. It was a lot of work. And I want to, we, Emmanuel and I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge, all of your secrets with us and to the, with the community at large. It's like a very deeply generous offering. So thank you, Angelique. <laughs> mm. You're welcome to stay. Um, the, somebody needs to close this event, so it's Jens or or me. And or, it's, it's as you wish. You're happy. Well, I I'll say what I have to say, and then if you want the mic back, you can have it. That's on my list. You're welcome. So um, yeah, not you know, there's not a lot. There's so much more to say, and there's nothing left to say, really, right? So um, I want to say a thank you, first of all, to Manu and Zoe. Really, without whom none of us would be sitting here. 
Thanks for your trust. Thanks for your confidence. Thanks for your wackiness. Thanks for your, you know, your, your willingness to dream. Like, you know, I mean, even the Canada Council had never had, they'd never received such a request. So, yeah, may it be the first of many others. Yeah, not necessarily, you know, like other, other people who have been extremely significant in this community and whose voices also need to be preserved in some fashion. Um, thanks to Lise and Espace Perrault. Without your support, they wouldn't have been able to do it. Same thing for Francine, who is a dear friend. Um, she's a big sister. The artistic director of Circuit Est, Centre Choreographique, without whom I wouldn't even have moved back to Montreal. I mean, you know, she brought me here almost twice a year for 15 years. So without that, I wouldn't have come to know the community. The community wouldn't have come to know me, and I wouldn't have been here now. I want to say thanks to Marc Boivin, who can't hear this, but he is a very, very, very dear and amazing friend, president of Espace Perrault, colleague, mutual inspirator. Um, thanks to VK, Sasha, MJ, Guy, for just sitting here with us as we think through and with and around dance and bodies. Thanks to Forest Space, Anna and Doug and the team. I feel like a regular in here. I'm in here all the time. I love it. Um, and Lilia and Jens, I don't know where to begin. I owe you all kinds of bubbles. <laughs> really, the, the um, you're brand new colleagues, and it's like we've known each other in another life. I am profoundly grateful to have you both as sources of support and inspiration and guidance. When I first started teaching, I reached out to um, somebody who I've actually lost contact with. He was a friend at the time. I think he's still a friend. But um, Tom Koch, who was an extraordinary, I'm sure he still is, Alexander teacher for the Forsyth Company. And um, I asked him to come watch me teach and kind of give me some pointers, advice, whatever. And he came and he watched me teach and we went for lunch afterwards and he said, you know, Angelique, we teach what we most need to learn. And I will, that is, it's a pearl of wisdom that I will hold on to forever. So Tom, this is for you. Um, perhaps the greatest thanks. If I hold it, you know, they kind of subside. Um, the greatest thanks that I can uh, offer, I think, are to my students. I wouldn't have become a teacher without the students, whatever student meant. And I have taught people who were a million times better dancers than I ever was. You know, finding myself teaching the Gulbenkian Ballet, and I thought, what the hell am I doing here, man? Like, I, like serious imposter syndrome. And to learn, to accept, to trust that what I lived in my body was, could offer an invitation to other bodies was extraordinary. Trust yourselves and enjoy. Um, final note for the folks, I'm, Angelique, how many of those tissues do you have? <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, you are, thank you so much for activating for space floors here today with movement. That's a, that's a way that you've come into the space that we haven't had the pleasure of, uh, you know, doing before. So that was fantastic. And um, I guess we'll close up to the folks on Zoom. We put the link to the Vimeo in the, in the chat, so you're more than welcome to consult the videos there and on the big screens here we'll also get the videos up so for those of you who are still in the space we appreciate you coming here hanging out with us all day long and uh, we'll make sure that you can watch the videos in many kind of places around the space here today okay bye everybody have a great day